thank you, Peter, for that welcome, and thank you, all of you, those of you who stayed on from an AGM and those who've come to hear me. This is an amazing building, and it's a tribute both to the drive and commitment of Welsh civil society and the confidence of a capital city, marking its status as a place with a proud history and massive potential. It's the perfect place to accept the challenge that I've been given by WCVA, to consider the future of civil society in 20, 10, 20, indeed 30 years time. Now I don't come with an astrological chart, I haven't got a crystal ball, I've got no intention of pretending to predict the future. Instead, I come with pretty long experience working in and around civil society, and at the end of my 10 years term leading the Joseph Brantley Foundation, an organisation that itself has spent over 100 years understanding the causes of social evils, and perhaps much, much more importantly, searching for the practical solutions to those evils. I come the month before I take on chairing an inquiry into civil society in England, which will need to be both wide-ranging and deep. Your invitation is as timely as it's appropriate. But I don't have a crystal ball, and I don't have neat policy solutions. What I want to talk about today is how we connect to our roots and connect to the real purpose that we have as a group of organisations. I want to start by commending WCBA for setting out the question for this inaugural lecture. They're demonstrating the sort of leadership that our sector so urgently needs. In our current really troubled environment, short-term responses, freely mixed with panic, are easy and oh so very tempting. Quick solutions, rapid fixes, saying what we've always said and getting what we've always got, protecting what is, lamenting what we've lost. We've all done that. We all know how to do that. But I think our times are too challenging and too fast changing for that sort of rather glib reaction. Peter and Ruth have asked me to stay away from the obvious and look, I hope, a bit more deeply, and I really hope a bit more creatively, creatively at where we are, and therefore where we might be. I come with far more questions than answers, and I'm sorry about that. I'm convinced that the right way is to start asking those questions, not pretending the answers are easy. This, I think, is the right time to ask these questions. It's the right place to start. So why now? My time over the last 10 years as Chief Executive of Joseph Brantley Foundation has been exciting, challenging, it's certainly never been dull. And I'm very proud that on the 6th of September we published a comprehensive long-term plan for solving poverty in the four nations of the UK. I'm proud because of its title. Its title says, We Can Solve Poverty in the UK. And believe me, every word of that title was chosen carefully. The we is all of us. The can is, we can do it. And the song is, let's stop throwing up our hands and panicking. We can do it. In the UK, because we recognise the four nations. But I'm proud because it's based in really solid evidence. Proud because it speaks to what individuals can do, what families can do, what communities, employers, businesses, and of course, government at national and central level can do, what local government can do, what devolved administrations can do. But I'm also really proud because it involves people in poverty. People in poverty assessed the research, commented on recommendations, told us when we got it completely wrong, and were there when we launched the report. In Westminster. And I'm proud because it speaks both to civil society and to the four different nations of the UK. On the 6th of November, here in Cardiff with the Bevan Foundation, we launched the Welsh version. We, we launched the Welsh version. Um, I think this is so good and so important. I asked my office to make sure there was one on every chair in this room. We've run out of copies already because so many people wanted it. But I gather that the Bevan Foundation have some and we'll certainly get some more. I'm proud about that because it wasn't because we wanted to do something with a Welsh accent. We didn't want to do something that felt comfortable in Wales. We did it because one of the defining features of public policy, and I'd say civil society in the last 20 years, has been the engine of devolution. The recognition that countries and regions have distinct identities, bring their own resources and capabilities to resolution. I don't know if it was ever possible or right for an organisation like Joseph Brantley Foundation, based in the north of England, to speak loudly and hope to be heard in Swansea and London in the same way that we might be heard in Leeds or Manchester. But it's certainly not possible now. 
And that change is because of government policy, yes, but it's also because of the power of civil society, through politics, through activism, through the arts, through creativity, a community and national level, ensuring that those voices are heard. Devolution is at the heart of our public policy system. In Wales, Joseph Rowntree Foundation has worked in partnership for nearly 10 years with the Bethan Foundation and been supported by our advisors, First Fib Sugar and recently Michael Tricky, to ensure that as far as possible, we're able to respond to those differences as they manifest themselves in Wales and act in a way that is both credible and connected. We don't always get it right. We certainly intend to do so. But let's move the focus from place, which is here, to time. Because my time at JRF has been bookended by, well, it's a bit of a cliche, but major game-changing events. I started in 2007. The 2008 financial crisis was probably the biggest ever in our lives, and it changed everything dramatically. I don't know if we even noticed at the time not quite how much it changed everything. The interconnected nature of our global economy, which we'd all talked about for years, was suddenly manifest and revealed in all its precarious uncertainty. Housing activity in the Rust Belt of Ohio had an immediate and marked impact on the Ronda Valley. Wobbles in the Shanghai Stock Exchange profoundly affected the outlook of the And as we watched wealthy bankers and their much, much less wealthy cleaners and support staff vacate their offices in Lehman Brothers in New York, we did know that the world had changed. And as we watched queues of people outside Northern Rock branches desperate to take out their savings, we knew that trust and confidence in our banks had evaporated. And as the banks deemed too big to fail were rescued amid rumours of cash points running out of money, we all knew that public expenditure would take a massive hit. Fast forward to 2016, and the country votes to leave the European Union. A second wake-up call, if you like. And although like the global financial crisis, one that maybe we should have seen coming, it was a surprise. Shocked commentators in London told us how surprised they were. Politicians on both sides of the debate looked stunned, frankly confused. But those of us living and working in Wales, in Hartlepool, where Joseph Rowntree Foundation supports the retirement community, in the overlooked and too often ignored parts of the country, I think knew better. I think we could see that people felt abandoned and ignored. We could recognise that people felt growth hadn't reached them and hadn't reached them those that they knew and loved. They could see growth, but didn't feel it. They felt they were paying too high a price for rapid change without receiving any of the benefits. And so they voted to reject the recommendations of the whole political class, the recommendations from big business and from commentators. They voted leave because they weren't satisfied with what they had, and because they didn't feel able to change things. Now, whether you think the vote was a triumph for sovereignty, and the start of a bright new future, or you think it was a catastrophic <coughs> error, or like the majority of us, you're absolutely, certainly not at all, at all sure. We can all agree that the vote provides us with certainty about the wrong thing. Our economic future will itself be uncertain. It may, in 20 or 30 years' time, be ever so much better. I don't pretend to know. But the short term, 10 or 15 years ahead, it could be uncertain. And for those of us concerned, with the strength and depth of communities, those who worry about the glue that binds us as a society. This uncertain economic future challenges our hopes and our plans. An economic recession, a social recession, we can never disentangle them. Then hot on the heels of Brexit, again confounding commentators, came the vote in the United States to elect Donald Trump, the candidate who claimed that forgotten men and women will not be forgotten again. Of course, there are differences between these events, and newspapers, social media, and publishing in the next few months will spell out in great detail the precise differences. But we can acknowledge some truths that they have in common, and that I suspect are recognized in this room. First, that there are people and places that feel so excluded and marginalized that they believe that safety first is simply not safe for them. Secondly, that there are people and places who feel so let down by what they see as the establishment, they feel betrayed by those they used to trust. And thirdly, that policymakers who made lazy assumptions about people and places they neither know or understand are doomed to fail. 
the crash of 2008, the Brexit vote, the Trump election. These events were of a global order. We can all put a date on them. We can reminisce about where we were when we first realized the global economy was in danger. We can remember the surprise on the morning of the 24th of June when we realized that Britain had changed course. But between these points, there were other major changes that have shaped the monetary sector and inform any consideration of the future of civil society. For civil society, it's never been more important to look ahead. But we need to do so with confidence in our history and our achievements. We can see so far now because we stand on the shoulders of giants. We in civil society have a long, honorable, and very powerful heritage. We provided the great civil institutions that made the massive transition of the Industrial Revolution tolerable. We responded to the moral panic of our urban squalor in the 19th century by developing institutions for fallen women, those of Dr. Bernardo's trade union movements. The great philanthropists such as Joseph Rowntree in York, George Cadbury in Birmingham, Bridget Bevan in Wales, didn't wait for permission. They identified a problem and marshaled their significant financial and intellectual resource to address it. The working men's clubs, the reading rooms, the welfare organisations of the large families were created out of struggle and out of determination to improve life for their citizens. The settlements, the girls' brigade, refugee association from the friendly societies are part of our history and proof that we have a strong, rich and effective history. We supported the new settlement at the end of the Second World War, a time when Europe was in such grave crisis, ravaged by the war, dealing with displaced people and refugees, austerity and rationing, by building and supporting new creative initiatives. There is power and capability in civil society. We must never forget that. Because times now are hard. Social capital is challenged. The bonds of solidarity are being undermined. We need to identify and name the changes that have built social capital and supported civil society. But just as importantly, we need to acknowledge clearly the changes that are currently depleting and threatening it. And the first big threat, and maybe opportunity, is insecurity at home in our households and our families. We need to acknowledge the very high level of volatility and insecurity in all of our lives. At the bottom end of the labour market, with part-time work and a new form of self-employment as hyper-flexibility has recreated the old world of casual labour in many industries. And all in an economy which seems to show few signs of growth offers continuing entrenched uncertainty and insecurity. A labour market in which the prospects of progression seem vanishingly small and about which Joseph Rowntree Foundation was able to report that four out of five people who start work no pay remain poor 10 years later. A decade in which food banks have mushroomed and the high costs of borrowing for the poorest have shot up. A decade characterised by an increasingly insecure housing market in which people in all 10 years, renting socially or privately or seeking to buy their own homes, <coughs> feel and indeed are insecure and uncertain. And in Wales we know just under a quarter of the population haven't got enough to make ends meet. Wave this around again. <laughs> That pace of change and consequent insecurity seems unlikely to stall. The advent of artificial intelligence, robotics, adapt adaptive technology bring huge advantages, of course, but it also brings uncertainty and changes to individuals and families across Wales and beyond. We know from previous major economic transitions that the aftershocks can persist through generations. And we also know that all of these changes to our economic security both imperil civil society and place massive demands on our stock of social capital. So that's the first big threat to civil society and our social capital. The second is, I think, the pace of our public expenditure and public services. Let's face it, there's never been a time in my working life, and I suspect in yours, when people didn't lament the reductions in public expenditure. The soundtrack to my working life has often been about limited resources, rationing, and making do. This is different. In 2010, major changes took place and continue to have an impact in spending round after spending round. The fundamental repurposing of local authorities so that the best and most clear sighted frequently describe, describe themselves as conveners and advocates, knowing full well that the days of delivering service are largely 
at least for now. Um, while the former Chancellor of Exchequer could announce in London, in the National Press, huge transfers within the economy, transformations in the way in which money is allocated, and in effect, a dramatic reversal of old conventions about the relationship between the voluntary sector and the state. It's the local authorities and voluntary organisations of every part of the UK that have restructured, reorganised, and in far too many cases simply had to cease to trade. A hardship caused by financial decisions may, some will argue, be necessary, but it's hardship nonetheless. And voluntary organisations across the UK know the real cost and the real pain of these massive changes. They know of the neighbourhoods with vanishing services, the places where emptying the bins is as much as can be achieved, the dilapidated public realm, the isolated older people left unvisited, the chaos of so much of our social care so tragically not addressed in yesterday's autumn statement. Let's just remind ourselves that the voluntary sector predicted that much of this would happen. We didn't just complain about our own future and security, and we predicted it not because we're exceptionally clever, but because we have the expertise and the relationships to assist, assess the impact of policy on people. For us, it can never be an accounting exercise. We also know that these huge changes spell a huge increase in the demand for social capital and a big reduction in support available to build it. Insecurity at home, financial problems in the state. And global insecurity. The major drivers of migration, the power of technology, the fall of the Iron Curtain, the opening up of China and India, the spate of trade agreements in the 1990s, are felt today in every part of the UK. While economists and businesses tell us that migration is an absolute good, and many of us know from our own lives the movement of people has enriched and strengthened communities. We mustn't be naive and glib about this. Migration brings challenges as much as it brings opportunities. The highest increase in the numbers of people born outside, outside the UK has, the always excellent Migration Observatory tells us, been in Merthyr Tidfall, where the migrant population increased by 227% between 2001 and 2011. That's a lot of change to deal with. The horrifying scenes from the Mediterranean and from the jungle in Calais challenge any notion of ourselves as an open, welcoming society. Cities of sanctuary across Wales are an essential expression of positive, open hand welcome hospitality. So there are things to celebrate, but we should acknowledge that in 1997, just 3% of the population reported migration was a problem. It's now 37%. I think that's a problem for us as civil society because our sense of ourselves, our sense of identity, our view of what defines us, what bonds our communities and our societies, is going to look different in the future. And the fourth big change is the breakdown of trust. As long as I can remember, I suspect the same is true for you, there's been talk about decline in trust. The great institutions of the country, the church, trade unions, royal family, press, parliament, the judiciary, They've all suffered from breakdown in trust, a growth in scepticism, an absence of the automatic deference which we are told they previously enjoyed. And largely, I think that's a good thing. I think automatic deference has been quite dangerous. <coughs> in the last decade, we've witnessed this loss of trust in our sector too. Criticisms of charities in the press from politicians and from commentators are not new. But we need to listen really hard or we're described as a self-serving elite, a remote source of power, bodies variously paying themselves too much or paying their poorest staff too little, and frequently both. Organisations which are described as hard to engage with, impossible to understand. Service providers offering, frankly, pretty poor services from time to time. A sector that seems to erect barriers to entry, stopping new ideas and approaches. Organisations that represent the loudest voices and further entrenched inequality. These are the accusations made about our sector, and they represent a loss of trust which we need to take seriously. We need to take it very seriously because it matters and trust is in our bones, but we need to take it seriously additionally because in a digitally enabled world, reputation, as all the leading businesses know, is even more hard won and very easily lost. How to investigate, to challenge, to expose, it's not just for those of us who see our role as holding markets and government to account. It's a challenge we must also be ready to face. 
And the big change of digital transformation. Ten years ago, it was easy to say the digital revolution would change, not just how we did things, but what we did. We were all terribly excited about search engines and algorithms, the ability to self-publish, the power to communicate. But in the intervening decade, the impact of the digital revolution really has changed everything, and changed it very fast. I always tell people that my late grandmother, who was not an unintelligent woman, said to me when I was young, you know, Julia, I think by the time you grow up, there'll be a computer in every town. She could have never predicted that there's a computer in every pocket in this room. Try imagining, remembering what life was like before that. It's not that long ago. Laugh at how you've authorised or outsourced your memory to your iPhone, which I frequently feel I've done. Notice how precisely targeted advertising comes your way every time you look at your laptop. Jamie Bartlett from Demos has demonstrated the ways in which this combination of accurate data and analytics and powerful communications capability is changing the way we do democracy. And of course it is. The supermarket loyalty card knows much more about me, certainly, than my nearest and dearest. Social activism of all sorts can be described disparagingly as mere collectivism. But it drives behaviour and it drives change. Information and money goes round the world at the touch of a button. Knowledge is shared, movements are built, lies broadcast, hate crime thrives. Post-truth politics, the changed nature of evidence, the digital revolution has changed us. We can talk about the power of digital transformation with breathless excitement. We do need to acknowledge that it's not all good. It's unleashed a whole new set of power dynamics. It's enabled the agglomeration of wealth just as surely as previous industrial revolutions. Global monopolies controlling information and connectivity have power that we simply couldn't have imagined before. The apparently cosy names of Airbnb, Task, Rabbit, Twitter, Deliveroo hide companies which have got infinitely wealthier, where conditions of work have been eroded enormously all by companies who hold that commodity, which is now infinitely more valuable than diamonds or oil, information. So big changes, some eternal truths. And finally, our continuing failure to take seriously the very real threats to our planet and to our ever more scarce natural resources has been given license by this distracting economic and political crisis. Our aging population never better educated, never healthier, but at the same time containing more people with disabilities, more people suffering from mental illness, more people recovering from diseases. Sources of celebration, of course, but also drivers of big change. And our increasingly fractured and worryingly divided communities. Communities that are split, I think understandably, on generational lines. Places where race, ethnicity and faith splinter and divide where people struggle to find the common good. This is where solidarity is diminished and overlooked, where we seek identity in what distinguishes us and not that which brings us together. That's why I say now is the right time to look again at the purpose of civil society, to spend some time considering what role we can play in the future, a future which seems more uncertain than it's ever been, but one in which we have tools, talents and capability which could not have been imagined by our predecessors, much of which has been provided by the changes I've described. Civil society doesn't exist in a vacuum. The changes to the state, its legitimacy and, the, and its power shape us fundamentally. So do changes in the market and the way in which capitalism operates. The major shifts in power, the vast inequality around us, the very real risks to cohesion, the ever-present prospect of civil unrest, are all expressions of the highly politicised world we inhabit. Now we know a bit about what it takes to build strong civil society and its close cousin social capital. I think in this room we know an awful lot. We also know quite a lot about how to destroy it. In our current highly insecure world, in which trust is a precious commodity, in which division flourishes, we need to think carefully, openly, creatively about what strengthens civil society and how all of us can work to make sure that we're ready to contribute wholeheartedly to the challenges that lie ahead. If, as I have argued, our future will make demands on social capital and civil space, I'd also like to argue that it's civil society that can pose questions and may help provide a route to some of the answers. But before I go on, I do need to acknowledge how hard this is. Building a civil society is not easy or fluffy. 
associational life is challenging and it's messy. The promotion of the common good requires complicated and uncomfortable trade-offs. It requires us to speak of unspeakable things. It demands levels of self-awareness and commitment, a willingness to engage where it is really difficult, to face the complexity of life and our contradictory needs, wants and aspirations. Civil society is not for the faint-hearted, the sloganeering, or those who simply want to call for a better way of being. It's for those who really do want to convey a lasting social change and a more sustainable society. That's why I say now is the time to take stock. The market has changed dramatically. The state has changed. The economy has changed. Our operating environment has changed. Now is the moment for civil society to look at itself and say, how should we change? For too long, I believe that we as a sector have looked outside for approval, for validation, sometimes even for permission. We've sought UK-wide answers to questions that are best addressed locally. We've challenged the infrastructure of the state to support us better. And all these things matter. But at a time of devolution, at a time when the central state, although we are still hugely centralised, is at least considering the devolution of power, and in many places power is being seized, isn't this the right time? civil society to look to its own future, set its own course, and challenge ourselves about where we go next. Discussions about civil society all too often end in recommendations that are highly entirely trans transactional or risk being platitudinous. We fear from saying that the answer lies in some different contractual relationship between local procurement authorities and the organisation of civil society. That's one response. Or we call on everyone just to be nicer and kinder. In thinking about these two routes, which I have lived through, and I've probably taken part in more of those conversations than many people, in thinking about this, I'm struck by a quote from Parker Palmer, eminent American Quaker. And he could be speaking to this sector. He says, we have to stop swinging wildly between corrosive cynicism and irrelevant idealism, because both those states result in their inaction. We have to learn to hold the tension and live into the paradox. This, I believe, encapsulates the tension in our sector. We can demand better contractual terms. We can argue if only our regulatory framework was more appropriate, all, we, all would be good. We can say that the funding ecology is not fit for purpose. We can gripe that we're not suitably respected. And in all of these statements, we're sort of correct. We're seeing the future. We risk seeing the future in fixes and in process change. Changes that we definitely need. But when we pursue them at the expense of all others, we are, as he would say, corrosively cynical. Or we can rush to irrelevant ideas. We can argue that anything we do is worthless while we still face inequality, economic inequality. But until poverty and hunger are relieved, we can only take birth of the cracks. Alternatively, as I said, we can plead with people to be better and somehow nicer. To imagine that the hard work of building community can be done through exhortation. Idealism is vital, it's the force that gets us out of bed in the world. But irrelevant idealism that dismisses pragmatism, that seeks only perfection, is as paralyzed, I believe, as corrosive cynicism. As our sector, we are at our very best when we hold these intentions, seeking the practical, the effective, the change, <coughs> while keeping our eyes resolutely in the destination. So where do we go? How does civil society become a strong force in our society that enables the flourishing of human capability. The bookends of my time at JRF have been the global financial crisis, as I come to the end, the decision to leave the European Union. This evening, I've celebrated our history of achievement. I've explored how society has changed in that time. I've demonstrated, I hope, that poorer people and places face crippling insecurity. I've said that communities are more divided than ever before. And I've said that there are huge opportunities in our changing population and in the digital revolution to really make a difference. I've said that all of these changes both challenge civil society and demand more from us. I think we now need to ask some pretty fund fundamental questions. Do we know what our purpose is? Do we know what we're good at? Do we know what we're good for? Do we understand and value the role of place? And are we build really building relationships and connecting people as we need. So starting with purpose, you may think this is all a bit self-evident, organisational theory level one. Don't we start every strategic away day, every strategic plan, talking about purpose? 
There was, those of us leading charities can cite our founding documents, we know the history of charity. But I mean something much more profound. I mean the consideration of what we're really here to do. Much of civil society is based on the idea of belonging of affiliation. Many of our most powerful and long-lasting organisations build associational life. They do it as RSBB Cymru, Cymru and Mail Voice Choir, a new self-built sustainable community or a neighbourhood watch scheme, or any one of the thousands of voluntary community organisations in membership of WCBA. Building connections between people, building a sense of belonging as a community of place or a community of purpose, linking people without power to power, sharing problems, jointly devising solutions. The origins of all our great institutions, including the one we meet inside today, come from groups of people getting together, assembling resource, and jointly making change for themselves and for their fellow citizens. That builds trust. It gives direction. It enables growth. I make the point about affiliation and associational life, not just because it's true and important, but also because our origins as places of affiliation and membership seem sorely tested. In part, of course, it has been the resource environment. What talk about civil society could avoid talking about funding and resources? There have been restrictions on funding for voluntary community organisations, and this has, of course, had a huge impact on our effectiveness. Of course it's true. But it's not the whole story. There's also the way in which that funding has been available. A focus on outcomes was, of course, important. I remember arguing for it and being impressed by the quality and depth of the arguments. I even wrote a book about full cost recovery, making the case the overhead costs need to be paid. Did that focus on outcomes change not just how we worked, but what we did? Did that risk monetizing our beneficiaries? Did it blind us to the wider context in which people's lives are shaped? More worryingly of all, have we confused accountability to our funders, a technical and hugely important accountability, with accountability to our members and to our beneficiaries, a true sense of connection and engagement? I think we have a number of purposes, and they're not all the ones that are listed in most of our founding documents. We have the purpose of connection, of bringing people together, of fostering affiliation and membership, connection which builds bridges between people, and further bridges between them and powers. We have the purpose of voice, not speaking on behalf of people, not wringing our hands about unheard voices, but making sure that everything, in everything we do, we provide a platform to ensure that the dispossessed can no longer be ignored. That will take us to angry and difficult places. It would challenge our precious professions. If we've learned nothing else in 2016, we've learned that people need their own voice. And we have the purpose of mediation, of recognising that our lives are always and everywhere made up of competing priorities. There is, of course, a tension between the preservation of green space and the need for new housing. There is, of course, a tension between people who've lived in the neighbourhood for generations and their new and maybe challenging neighbours. The tension between generations. Civil society in all its forms can create tools to enable people to speak, and perhaps more importantly, to listen can support those whose voices are ignored, and can support people through the most difficult decisions that we all need to make. So a refreshed look at purpose and a recognition of membership, affiliation, feeling of belonging, may, for some of us, be as important as the services we so properly provide. The second dimension of fruitful exploration is about place. Place matters. The global elite may talk about having no sense of place, of being happy to settle wherever they stop, or proudly being citizens of the world. And in many senses, they're right. We are all migrants, and we all move. But where we live matters, and place matters hugely in two ways. It matters because there are places where poverty is locked in, where transport's vanished, where there are no jobs, where the routes to employment are blocked, and people don't even get the jobs on their own doorstep, as recent JR research demonstrated. But there's also the other sense of place. A place is a sense of identity, of belonging, of being part of something. Places where the public realm depresses rather than inspires are different from one's where it's inspiration. Places where the high street is dilapidated and the implicit message is that people who live here don't count. They don't deserve it. Civil society can elevate place, both through the power of transaction, our economy, and the power of emotion. Civil society bodies are economic actors. 
but we can also inspire. We can bring beauty to places that are overlooked, make culture something available to all, not just the elite who can afford to go to Cardiff's Opera House. Strong place-based civil society engenders confidence, pride. That's what we've always done. Are we doing it enough? Do we know enough about the power of place and the way in which solidarity is forged or destroyed? This, too, is a challenge to our sector. Placemaking is in our DNA. The vast majority of civil society organisations come from a place. From universities to housing associations, community foundations, neighbourhood groups, place matters to us. And the prospects and opportunities of place matter. They matter because they provide a sense of hope and a sense of belonging. They matter because people in places with prospects feel safer and are much more inclined to participate. Place matters because our public life is a conversation, and it's a conversation that starts locally and involves people in the place. And finally, people. People matter. It should be self-evident, but people matter. And every part of our civil society has been animated by a relationship, by a relationship between two or more people. And yet to speak of such things is to risk the shuffling embarrassment when we talk about kindness and loneliness and the other things we know really matter. In a JRF program about loneliness, one respondent said, and it moved me deeply, I'd really like to talk to someone who wasn't paid to talk to me. <laughs> Isn't that the heart of civil society? The giving without reward, the fostering of good relationships, the mutuality which is neighbourliness, the kindness of strangers. My decade leading one of the bigger civil society organisations in the UK has taught me there are things we desperately need as a society which we know how to do. We need to support affiliation, we need to foster connection, we need to learn to mediate difference. To do that we need to recognise that our tools are in place and that places really matter, but so too do the relationships we foster. We have powers and capabilities that the founders of civil society could only imagine. We have freedom, the digital revolution brings us new ways of connecting and gaining control. It enables the voices of the dispossessed to be amplified and their experience understood. Our organisations bring huge knowledge and experience. We know how to develop new organisations and support and enable them. We know what our purpose is. It is to connect people to each other and so build a stronger and more sustainable society. Our sector is at its very best a connected sector. It connects people without power to places of power. It connects within communities and between them. It connects with those who need, with those who can give. It connects people with a shared interest. It enables voice and contact. It provides a welcome for the stranger. At its heart, it provides for connections in our society. In concluding, let's remember that the referendum result was achieved by a slogan. One which you can be sure was tested and examined in great detail and one which clearly worked both in the folk schools and later in the ballot box. Take back control. We are the sector that promises control, that talks about self-governance, that holds in our midst the cooperatives and the mutual organisations, that values associational life above all else, that knows in our bones that it's people taking control of their own lives that builds confidence and self-determination, that knows that agency matters for individuals and for places, that values self-organisation. It is our sector that has enabled groups of parents and children with profound and multiple learning difficulties to press for a better deal. It is our sector through trades unions and community action that has highlighted slavery in our supply chain and provided both support and comfort, as well as achieving vital changes to the law. It is our sector that brought together people in the most dispossessed communities, fighting to change the environment in which they live. From men's sheds to impact hubs, from neighbourhood renewal to allotment society, from community drama to mentoring schemes, it is our sector that has championed the needs of people to take back control, to assert their values over a remote state or an increasingly careless market. It is our sector that has over decades connect connected communities, provided opportunities for engagement, and worked with others to ensure that injustice cannot survive. And it is our sector that has, over so many dec decades, organised and agitated to make sure that no one, no one, could ever be overlooked. And it's never been more needed. Thank you.